namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sankhang namasami Yeah, tonight uh, for me feels like a, a kind of a special night giving a Dhamma talk. I kind of feel a real warmth in my, my heart. I've just been uh, contemplating this, this last sit, the, just the community that's here. Um, just uh, as, you know, kind of contemplating today, and it's like when I uh, returned from spending a couple of years in New Zealand. Um, I think it was uh, Tan Pesla was uh, had, was uh, Anagarika, and so basically everybody, kind of you know, junior to to Tan Pesla has kind of you know, started the training um, since I've been here, just the, this uh, bit of time, and uh, you can see that's a significant part of the, the monastic community is uh, um, you know. Has has started the you know the people that are living here have started the training in that period of time and then even everybody senior to him you know I was here for their uh, their ordinations um, even say Ajahn Karunadamo he was uh, I came very shortly after his uh, novice ordination so I even I even knew him as a novice and uh, was uh, blessed to be here for his bhikkhu ordination and so you know the only person whose ordination I wasn't here for was the Wasajim Pasana, so, um, <laughs> so, uh, and uh, even, you know, thinking of Debbie and Beth, you know, it's like, uh, um, I think I've, probably of everybody in the, in the Sangha, I've probably known Debbie probably longer than anybody else almost, I think she was probably already here as a guest when I first started coming, and and uh, Beth, I've known almost, I think, eight or nine years now. We met in, in New Zealand when I was was there. So just with the, the monastic community, there's this real strong connection and feeling of family. And and then, you know, I came into the hall tonight. There's just a couple of people here that, that uh, new guests that I haven't met. But, you know, everybody else, I, I, it's kind of odd to give a talk, even here, where you can actually know everybody's name. And... Uh, so it really feels special, you know, looking out right now to seeing so many people that are, you know, become very good friends of mine over the last, you know, 20 years. And uh, so there's a special feeling kind of for me right now. Is it, everybody here knows, at least the community does, that uh, in a week I'll be departing, uh, you know, heading up to the Pacific Hermitage for the winter and, and spring. And then... Uh, plan to return for just a short visit where I'll kind of be a guest here uh, for about a month and then my schedule after that I have some plans but nothing's nothing's concrete right now but I'm very seriously you know thinking of it in terms of it's just the the training is continuing and for me and you know this next next phase of of my life that uh um, yeah, it's just it's a continuation of the monastic training. It would be in a different situation, and and uh, you know, reflecting a lot about you know what uh, worked for me at a Bayagiri and what what I value and what I hope to you know continue. And uh, you know, as I was thinking about. Uh, you know, Talking tonight, uh, another kind of important aspect came up was that uh, you know um, Anagarika Jordan just uh, went into white. Congratulations! And, uh, um, but uh, and then also this coming week we'll have uh, 
Hanagarika Ryan and Hanagarika Gary will be uh, taking on the brown robes as novices. And uh, so I've um, been thinking a lot about, uh, yeah, training and uh, um, if there's anything I could you know, say this evening, is, you know, I kind of see myself as more like a kind of cheerleader for, you know, encouraging people to, yeah, to take the the training, training seriously and uh, you know, find ways to enjoy it, and I was doing some some reading this week on the the, the rules of Saint Benedict. You know, I was just back visiting my parents, and and uh, a professor that I had in college gave me gave me this book called Benedict's Dharma, and I'd, I'd seen it before, but I'd actually never um, uh, read it the whole thing. So I started reading it, and at the very beginning, the um, the the author sort of points out that the um, say you know our our training rules we call the Vinaya or the monastic discipline. But uh, for the rule of uh, the most Benedictine monasteries, fall, it's called the, the rule of Saint Benedict, and he just takes that first word "rule," and in the Greek and in the Latin, the uh, the the word that they translate as "rule" can also be translated as as a trellis, and uh, makes a you know, kind of an interesting point with that, and then points out that they didn't, uh, the, the author um, was, was probably Christian, so he didn't use the word Vinaya, but uh, was picking up the word Dhamma. And you know, I, was, I actually went and looked in the, one of the Pali dictionaries to make sure it was, was actually right. But you know, even in the Pali dictionary I had, the, the first definition that comes up for Dhamma is it's like a, um, to hold uh, a foundation. And so you know, sort of like a, a trellis, you know, kind of rules is a, um, is a beautiful um, analogy, I think, for, for monastic training. You know, you know foundations is, a, is, a, is another good one, to hold something. So to, to take on a monastic training, to, to hold it, to, um, you know, we can hold something too tightly and it, it wears us out, it gets us tired, uh, it can get us frustrated. Uh, you can hold it too loosely and you drop it and break it, or um, um, you, know, you can't use the object correctly, or you know, if you're holding a living being, you know, if you hold it too tightly, you can damage it. Uh, if you let it hold it too loosely, you might again drop it, or if it's a bird, like it might fly off. So you know, you, we have to learn how to hold things correctly, and uh, in, in a way that's skillful and, and helpful for us. And so I think I've kind of always had that, that kind of understanding for myself about, you know, sort of monastic forms, that it's a foundation, that it's something that, that holds us, holds the community together. And, you know, but hearing this, you know, the, the, the Greek or Latin being a trellis, it's like that's a really interesting analogy that I'd never thought of before. And uh, it's, an, it's an interesting image in that... Uh, that uh, you know, it's holding again something that's living. The trellis is for for holding vines or plants, and that uh, it gives them direction. It gives them a, a plant, a, you know, a, a route to go that uh, um, takes it closer to the light. It uh, you know brings it off the ground, sort of you know worldly or um, the baser. Kind of elements, you know, takes it out and up, up into the air where it's maybe healthier and towards the light. Also, this this week we've had uh, we were blessed with having uh, uh, someone contacted the monastery that we we hadn't known, and uh, had worked for the forestry department, and uh, just hearing about the fires and being a Buddhist uh, was kind of. Uh, interested in what we're doing and, and uh, just decided to make contact and offer some advice and suggestions. And so he came up and spent a few days with us. And, and uh, one of the things he was, he, one of the, uh, I thought was interesting analogies he used was uh, like, uh, you know, every year we spend a little bit of time clearing dead brush away from, from cabins and, and uh, trying to, to hopefully make them, you know, fireproof. 
But we were kind of doing it out of ignorance. Uh, we really didn't, you know, we had an idea of what that meant. Um, of, uh, um, yeah, just remove, remove everything from 30 feet away from the cabin, you know. And, and I think we've done a pretty good job for the, the manpower and, and uh, our, our knowledge. But, you know, listening to someone who's actually an expert in the field, it was, it was quite fascinating. And, like, one of the uh, ways he was talking about it was just, like, you know, um, be the fire, you know. Actually, as you're as you're contemplating um, clearing around a cabin or making something fireproof, like you know, if you were a fire, what would you do? You know, how would you move through the forest? Well, most of us have never been in a forest fire. Even even this one that we just experienced, we actually weren't here for it, um, and uh, and it was a extreme. Uh, Example because of the winds for the people that did uh, experience it down in the you know, south of us. But uh, you know, he was pointing out to us that most you know a normal forest fire as it comes through, it's only about two inches tall, and uh, it just sort of goes and catches one leaf on fire, and then it's you know sort of becomes char and then touches the next leaf, and then that one catches on fire, and it actually might move you know actually quite slowly through the forest. And so what it does is it uh, yeah, just sort of very slowly sort of creeps along. If there's wind, of course, it moves faster and maybe it's a little bit higher because of the, the oxygen in the air, fuel. But normally we just sort of go around maybe even up to about a foot height. And, uh, and if, it, uh, if it's a normal forest that's really healthy, it would just, uh, just sort of move through and, and just burn the, the leaf litter on the, on the ground. But uh, his, his analogy was like, you know, just imagine that you're, you know, Two feet tall, sort of, you know, walking through that that forest, and and uh, you know everything that you can touch will will burn. And so, you know, his his suggestion to us would be that you know everything about three feet from three feet high <laughs> down to the ground should be, you know, in a certain radius of cabins or where you want to have a fire break is just that's it's everything's de-leafed, uh, uh, dead branches, and and uh, and so you you do that, and. Uh, so when I started thinking again of like this this image of the trellis, it's like uh, you know, so like our vinaya is uh, our say morality, you know, whatever. If it's five precepts, eight precepts, ten, two hundred twenty-seven, the monastic code that we have, sort of the rules within the particular monastery, it's like you know having having an understanding of that and sort of putting it on a trellis. You know, kind of raising it off the ground, sort of elevating it, having seen it as something of value, um, kind of like displaying it almost, and uh, you know, bringing it into the light and understanding it. But also this, uh, this thinking of what what David, who was the, the man who was here, was telling us was that you know that if you clear everything off the you know two to three feet off the ground, then uh, then it's it's safer too. So it's like you know, ma maintaining it. Again, so it comes into me like the analogy again of the foundation, sort of like if you have a plant that's sort of in the ground and you have this trellis, you know, it's, it has a foundation in the ground. But then most plants that I've kind of seen, the you know, the bottom after it starts getting larger and the, the, the leaves are mature up above, the, the bottom part just naturally kind of dies off. And so it's, uh, it's already sort of like naturally having this, this fire break. And uh, so doing that, you know, having a trellis, getting the, the plant off the ground, it's, it makes it safer for it. It's, it's harder for it to, to be damaged, to uh, um, do damage to itself. You know, so it's like a lot of what the, uh, you know, for, for us in our training, you know, the monastic rules and the etiquette is, it is, uh, you know, the Buddha... You know, obviously, is encouraging us to develop wisdom, to develop uh, uh, you know insights into the four noble truths, and uh, you know to come to you know really deep understanding of of how we create our our own suffering and and giving us tools to to see through those and to to let them go, to let let the causes go, and so yeah, seeing that. Um, you know, the 
you know, the Buddha points out that the, the way to, to have that deep, that deep wisdom is, is kind of lack of remorse, the lack of remorse and having no regrets. And so that, uh, that's why he, he points out these, you know, the precepts, whatever, whatever level we're doing. It's like uh, we were talking about Bhikkhu Bodhi earlier today. He's, um, and uh, um, it was actually Ajahn Jeff who said this, but there was a, after the September 11th, 2001, there was a, an article that came out and it was sort of like, you know, Buddhists should do this or should do that. And, and I think it was Ajahn Jeff pointed out, there are no shoulds in Buddhism. It's not like you should follow the precepts or... You know, you must follow the precepts, but I, I kind of look at it as a, if, if there is a should, it would be the Buddha would say, you know, if you want to be happy, you know, this is the way I suggest you go about it. You know, if you want to have, uh, you know, a clear mind, if you want to have a mind that, uh, yeah, is, is, has lack of remorse and regret and feels good about itself, feels good about, uh, you know, how, how we live in life, how we interact with each other. You know, having that foundation in, in, in the five precepts or the eight precepts or 10 or 227. That's how the, the, the Buddha is pointing to, to how to do that. You know, at, at a pretty deep level, um, you know, if people don't really sort of have a deep understanding of, of what the, you know, say a fully ordained monk, what our, what our, our rules are, we keep saying, you know, 227, you know, at some level, it's 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 really very strongly t- attached or uh, you know uh, correlates to the ten precepts of being a renunciate and um, you know having having precepts around not using money, being celibate, and uh, um, but if you if you start looking at a lot of the the two hundred twenty seven they. A lot of them just are very specific to situations that have arisen um, based on the, so those same ten precepts. And uh, in many communities, people will um, uh, take on uh, you know added precepts for just a night. Like tonight, people took the the eight precepts, and so you know we don't expect that everybody's you know, out in the world, you know, living, living by the eight precepts. And at some levels, we don't even encourage it. You know, people, you know, definitely uh, five precepts and, uh, you know, refraining from things like uh, intoxicants and drugs and alcohol that can sort of, you know, make it difficult to, to keep moral precepts. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the precepts of renunciation, like, say, not eating in the afternoon or uh, not laying down, you know, in a comfortable bed, you know, these, these kinds of precepts that, you know, we encourage people to do them occasionally just to, uh, um, to have that experience of renunciation, to see the benefits that, that can come from that, how it kind of frees up the mind, frees up space for our day, and, uh, you know, hopefully we see, if we practice with that and pay attention to it, it can give us you know, inspiration for, for meditation practice. Uh, you know, I do know of certain situations where, you know, especially like the, you know, the men and women, the construction workers that come here to work, and, you know, oftentimes they are kind of intrigued by what we do. I don't know if any of them have picked up a Buddhist meditation practice, but, you know, I can imagine that would be very difficult for, you know, somebody like that to, to be not eating in the afternoon. Or eating in the evening, so it's you know, it's not always a situation where people should be taking on eight or ten ten precepts. Um, but it's good to it's good to explore, to practice, you know, to try it out. One one piece of advice or. I remember hearing this very early on in one of the Vinaya classes that, that we were doing here. So Vinaya is sort of the, the monk's rules, monk's etiquette that we we take uh, three months in the in the summertime to do to to go through uh, significant portions of, of the training. Um, and uh, I don't remember who who made the comment now, but uh, 
it was like, uh, you know, well, kind of back up first. It's like, uh, you know, sort of like, say, you know, Anagarka Jordan. It's like, uh, I don't know if you've been instructed yet or encouraged, but the the Sakya rules, the, um, it's in the Buddhist monastic code one. It's like, yeah, it's really good to, to study those, to, to read through them, and if you have questions, to, to ask various questions you know, community members about them, practice with them, because it, it does really form the the basis for our, our etiquette as, as monks. And so it's a, it's one of the last rule sections we chant when we do the, uh, every two weeks we get together and and, and, and go through the rules in, in, the, in the Pali language. And if any of us know that we have broken that offense, we just, we, 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 uh, we Point it out to somebody else. We tell somebody we're we're honest about it, and and, and, and bring that up to each other. And, and before the we actually before we chant the the the, the patimoka, the monks' rules, we um, get together with one other monk, and 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 most of us do it in English. Like if we know we've we've had an offense, then we we uh, um, point you know tell tell them the other monk about that, and then. In the Pali uh, formulation that we do, it's a sort of like, you know, we you're, you're saying that you have an offense in this, and the the monk asks you in, in Pali, but it's basically it's like, do you see it as an offense? And we and then we say yes, we do, and then they say, okay, well, you know, strive to 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 do better, you know, to try to you know keep that precept in the in the future, and then and the then you say, okay, yes, I will, and so it, uh, it's just a really beautiful way of of us. Acknowledging that, yeah, we do struggle. We do, you know, we don't always um, are able to maybe, you know, keep all, keep all of the rules purely. But we, we we see it as an offense, and that we we strive to 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 keep them. And so that creates a real harmony in the community. And that uh, just knowing that you're with other people who, yeah, we're not perfect, but we're we're willing to try and we're willing to give each other the space to to learn how to do it. And it just creates a real safety. And then that safety, again, comes back to, allows us to, to, to have that space to meditate, to, to learn how to you know, go deeper into our, into our experience. But the, uh, so the, uh, um, what I was going to mention earlier, the quote I remember hearing was that, so when we, we, we chant all these rules or, study, you know, things like, uh, you know, killing another human being. If I did that as a monk intentionally, you know, then I'm no longer a monk. And uh, so it's like, someone pointed out, that's like, you know, that's, that's, like, that's like a log. You know, we don't get too many logs stuck in our eye. You know, it's like, it's, that's a pretty gross kind of, a, kind of offense. And, you know, I think we have to worry about any, anybody here in this room <laughs> doing that. But it's the... It's the splinters that cause the problems. You know, it's a, you get a splinter in your finger, and it's just it's a real irritant. It, it can actually even make it difficult to meditate because it just you know the whole mind just goes to this little tiny irritant that's under the skin that's really causing a an issue. Or if you get a splinter in your eye, you know that was the analogy. You don't get a log in your eye, but if you get a, a splinter in your eye. That's extreme. That's one of the most painful things that you can experience is, is having a, a splinter in your eye, and uh, and so that's why we in, in the monastery or in, in a training situation why we we spend a lot of time, you know, talking about uh, um, uh, how the community agrees to do things. If if you lived here as a guest even for a short time, after the morning. Breakfast. We have a work meeting, and it's pretty common. Um, Dee and Sandra have had the experience of being here as, as guests for a while, and I think probably you know, seeing how we live and experiencing that was probably uh, unique or quite interesting for them, just to see how how decisions are made, and um, it's very organic, and so. There's there's many times throughout the day where you know people will bring up things like uh, uh, I've been kind of hounding the community about. Uh, seems like the last couple of times I've been coming up, there's a building that should be locked and it hasn't been locked, and and so 
you know, just bring that up. And it's, it's not blaming anybody. I'm not speculating who it was. I actually have a suspicion that some of the times it was me who didn't lock the door. And uh, so it's very tricky to, we, we learn how to, uh, you know, say admonish or to, to give feedback because oftentimes we find out that actually we're the ones who are doing it or, or we're doing it as well. And so, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, so like, yeah, we just, uh, this, a this afternoon chanted the, the monk's rules and then after the, the ceremony was over, we just did just a very short business meeting and, yeah, I think five or six sort of just, just minor kind of things came up about, you know, how we can be more beautiful as a community, things that would support each other if we all were kind of following the, the same, the same program. Very minor things. I mean, one of them actually was, you know, when we leave the office, the monk's office, you know, just push the chair underneath the, the desk. You know, so it's a, you know, it seems very trivial, but, you know, when we all do that, it, it makes the monastery beautiful, makes it quite, uh, you know, attractive. And when you come into a room and everything's nice and orderly, it, it has an effect on our minds. You know, we, we spend a lot of time uh, talking about our, our cabins, that we live in, just, uh, you know, it, it was funny to me, it's like the, the morning of the fire, um, I, when the person came to wake me up, I didn't hear any urgency in their voice, so I thought it was just like a little grass fire in the monastery, and so, you know, even though someone told me there was a fire and it was two in the morning, I still, I folded my bedding, I, I took my thermo rest and, and uh, folded it up and, and, and put it in its proper place, and when I left, I made sure that the, the cabin, everything was in order as I was leaving. And it wasn't until I opened the door that I realized that could have waited. You know, that was a situation where maybe I didn't need to fold my blanket up. But, uh, but you know, part of the training is, is that every morning, that's what we should do. You know, if, uh, if uh, Lumpur is taking somebody, a guest around, you know, to show them or very senior monk shows up and they want to see one of our cabins, you know, maybe it's your cabin we're going to show them. And it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, part of the training to, to do that. And it's these little things. It's, uh, Lumpur was pointing that out a little after the monks do the, the chanting. You know, we, we get a little uh, 10, 15 minute uh, uh, reflection, Dhamma talk at the end of the chanting, and so Ajahn Pasana was really pointing out that, you know, it is the, the little things, it is the uh, um, putting forth the effort in, in these, these little, these, you know, say little areas, that uh, the etiquette kind of things. And he, he also pointed out that, you know, people that don't do that, the people that neglect that, they usually, you know, the, if, if you can't do the little things, then it, it's it's uh, harder to do the bigger things. It's not the way he phrased it, but, you know, it's, uh, most monks or people who, who start the training here, it's like, yeah, when they don't pay attention um, and, and, you know, put forth effort in, the, in, in those kinds of areas, the etiquette, then they, they tend not to stick around very long. And so if we kind of value the the training, we value... Um, you know, for, I remember for myself when I when I first came was I think Ajahn Jayasaro was the was the abbot of Wapananachat when I first stayed there and and uh, and uh, later was at IMS and a couple of the uh, senior Sila Draws uh, were there and uh, I just remember watching them the Sila Draws and uh, Ajahn Jayasaro and a couple of the other really senior monks at Wapananachat when I was there and. And uh, I saw a real sense of humor, a real lightness about them. Um, you know, not holding things as tightly as I would hold things. And I just had this sense that they know something that I don't. And they didn't get it from a book. It was a real, real strong sense of that. You know, it's, it's something that they got from the, the training. It's something they got from the, the livelihood. And uh, it really inspired me to... Uh, to you had to look into that. Yeah, one of the monks last night was sharing with me that, uh, you know, just little, little bit, little efforts that we make, you know, can go a, a long way. And uh, um, this uh, monk was telling me that he was actually inspired to, to come live here. 
um, because uh, he was in a situation where somebody was actually quite rude to him and, uh, you know, kind of asking him to do something and just kind of rushed and, you know, just impolite, a little rude. And uh, he was kind of shaken by that. But he said very shortly after that, probably the same morning, that monk came over and apologized to him. And uh, he said that, that, that may be, you know, what propelled him to become a monk. Just that simple having someone, you know, come back and apologize to him. And it's like he said, you know, it's just, that doesn't happen in the, the world that he lived in. And so just something really simple like that can have a huge impact. And somebody else was, was telling me a story that they were uh, on a, uh, um, a prison work, work crew. And that uh, was, I, I love the story that uh, they were making cookies at Christmas. And uh, the, the rule was that they were allowed, to, I think, think how the story went, they were allowed to have uh, two cookies after they, after they, they made all of these, these uh, cookies. And uh, the, uh, um, after kind of the, the party and, and was going over the, the commander, as, you know, kind of... Um, raised a, a concern that he, he thought that somebody had taken more than two, two cookies and asked if anybody had. And this person said that he, he raised his hand and said that he had. But he knew there was going to be consequences for that. It's like, you know, there was, nobody had any proof, um, you know, that, uh, that, he, that he had or hadn't. And, but he knew if he, if he raised his hands, he, he was going to get a demerit point, you know, for, for, for having done it. But... But he was asked directly, did anybody do it? And he did. And he decided to, to own up to it. You know, it's like it was, it was a mistake he made, but he decided, okay, I'm going to be, be honest. And then he said, and when he did that, several other people raised their hands too. And, and uh, you know, they came up to him later and they said, you know, we were really inspired by the fact that you, you were honest. You know, like we, we look up to you, we see you as a, as a role model. And that... Uh, the fact that you're you're honest that that inspires us to do the same thing. So it's a you don't know. I don't know the story about you know how that how the people that you know sort of also raise their hands, but you can see just you know having having that integrity, that honesty, can make a difference in other people's lives. Yeah, so just uh, I think for myself, um, I feel kind of uh, very blessed. The fact that uh, you know when I when I first you know first came to the monastery, that uh, say you know, studying Vinaya was something that uh, I took a lot of joy in, and uh, um, yeah, did take a lot of interest in it and. And uh, um, yeah, and you know, spent a lot of time. I think uh, actually in the early days, that's, that's kind of what I kind of envisioned. If you, if you have sort of visions of what you'll what you'll become or what you'll you'll be if you ever become a senior monk, and and I, I took joy in sort of you know studying the Vinaya, and I always kind of saw that that's that's probably what I would you know take the most joy in if I was a senior monk would be teaching teaching the Vinaya class and you know. Good fortune to be in Ajahn Chandaka's uh, class that he did at uh, Wat um, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know, it kind of inspired me to take his notes and actually um, wrote a wrote a book based on on that teaching method. And uh, I remember the first, I used it for a couple of years here, um, just using just just that book, using it completely through. And uh, the the years that I did that, I actually memorized the, the the Buddhist monastic code, like every single scenario. It's like 300 pages or 380 pages. This book, and uh, um, when I was teaching the class, at least for the class, like if uh, what it does is it kind of goes through 
I call like case case scenarios. Like you go through studying a rule about say like stealing, and then it goes through various situations. Like you know you're walking down the street and you you find uh, you know a wristwatch on the side of the road and you take it. You know did you steal it? And you have to go through all these different factors to know if you, if it really was stolen or not. And people have to be able to explain the rule in, in kind of detail to to answer it. And oftentimes there'd be like twenty twenty five questions at the end of these chapters and we had it uh, um, set up so it followed pretty closely to Ajahn Jeff's Buddhist monastic code and uh, when I would teach the classes I would know exactly what page you know every single one of those different scenarios where the results came from and so you know I think that was you know it's really good to to kind of get that kind of grounding foundation in, in, in the rules to you know, not necessarily that there there are so many and so many different permutations it's I think it's impossible not impossible but for for me anyway it's it's I, I can't keep that in my mind the, the exact page numbers and what the results are from every single scenario but you know after, after living um, this this lifestyle for so many years you know you you get a real good sense of of you know what is and isn't an offense and may not know exactly why, but you, you do know it's, I guess, an area not to tread into or, you know, that's that's a safe place to go. But also, too, you just, you'll know where the resources are. If you are in doubt, you know, you'll know uh, where where the that information can be found or you'll you'll know which monks you can trust to, to, to have that kind of knowledge. And But it, it does take the effort to, to put forth into both the... Yeah, studying the the, sut the suttas, studying the monastic code, uh, and uh, but more importantly, it's it's really it's like uh, we were talking about the uh, you know paying attention to you know how we how we live in community, how we not so much the you know it's like w one thing I think what I learned was is that you know when you when you first start reading all the the, the about the codes. It was coming back to that analogy of sort of dhammas being, you know, holding or being a foundation. You, you can, you almost have to in the first first uh, five years or so, hold the rules pretty tightly. You know, to to try not to break them, to truly really try to understand them. But it can seem kind of tight, and uh, and so, but it's good to to do that for a while, just to, so you, you get to know them. You know how you react to them, um, and then you know kind of see how what our attitudes are when we do hold something. We hold it dear. You know, hold it with fear. Do we hold it uh, you know, just out of a sense of responsibility, or do we hold it? You know, say something. Do we hold it because we hold it dear? Um, and then we can watch our attitudes, like when we see other people who you know we have a we feel like we you know, we're holding precepts really well, but we see other people who aren't, you know, then do we get judgmental? Do we get, uh, do we want to support them? Do we want to be helpful? Or do we want to be critical? And just seeing how the mind works with these, with these rules. And hopefully eventually, kind of, you know, if we, we have held them tightly, um, then we kind of see like, okay, well, how can I, that's, that is painful, that's hard. How can I, how can I be skillful? How can I hold these things in a way that's beneficial for my own mind and beneficial for other people? And uh, and so the the whole the whole thing becomes a training. And as I was saying, like the for where wherever I'm going, it's going to be yeah the the training will continue. It, uh, even yes you know now that I'll be not having maybe the, the direct support of the the sangha every single day. You know not seeing you know. Other people wearing brown robes around me and shaved heads, you know, so much that, uh, um, you know, then I'm going to have to learn how to have that inner support, you know, to not not need the, or not not necessarily need, but just not having that uh, external visual experience, and still how to uh, value it, how to you know, be my own be my own trellis for the for the support of the of the vinaya. So yeah, for uh, 
the Anagarikas, when it just, just became an Anagarika. There's a couple of uh, people here sitting in lay clothes who are hoping to become Anagarikas, and uh, Gary and Ryan who are about ready to come summon eras. I rejoice in all of your uh, decisions, and I wish you the best of best of luck, and uh, hope you benefit from the wisdom of the community, and we're able to help everybody along. So I'll leave that for a reflection this evening. So this evening is the uh, Lunar Observance Night, and uh, for those who wish, it can continue uh, with a uh, vigil. Um, it's also Saturday night, and tomorrow uh, is the afternoon program, so uh, just to... Uh, make it uh, optional for, for everybody. Um, the, uh, if you got the steam, great. Uh, if you uh, uh, I mean, I already know I'm not going to do it, so. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but, uh, but just to, uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, People have steam power, good. If not, fine. It's the uh, it's like a double header, Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. So, and pace yourselves. <laughs>